on for 33 years or more. Got, I think we met them about a year after their marriage, coming to a church that I was an assistant pastor at in Jersey. And it's just been a wonderful journey to know him. And I'm just uh, proud to see how God has used him over these years. And he's been connected with Answers in Genesis. And if you were here for Sunday school, you saw just his testimony, how God amazingly used him to get connected and then begin to teach for probably 10 or more years. And, and Lord willing, he's, he's might be planning to do that again here next year. So God has used him greatly. And he's going to be sharing some, an awesome thing here. Uh, so, uh, Ron, take it away, buddy. All right. Good morning. Good to be here. I, I can guarantee you this. What you're going to see this morning, no other church in the United States or probably the world is going through the topic you are. So what I've chosen to do this morning uh, is the talk that I do for Answers in Genesis at the Creation Museum. I've been doing it there since it opened. It's a specialty talk. So it's not going to be a traditional sermon, but we will get into the Word of God. But we are going to, we're going to talk about some pretty cool things so the, I am not actually an employee of Answers in Genesis. I'm contracted. So I have, I've been paid to write some articles from them. I've written some book chapters. Uh, I do some talks. I've taught online classes. So this is the, the current name of the talk. They call it Carnivorous Plants, Beasts of the Bog. It used to be called Cursed Plants. So it's a specialty topic, and uh, it's a hobby I've had since I was about five years old. So it's a, it's a hobby of mine. And this is how I got involved with this particular topic, was when I was a youngster, I grew up in a family, we were not Christians, we were very much into science fiction, and there were a lot of really corny, by today's standards, movies about plants trying to take over the human race, and I thought these were the bomb when I was, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old. And uh, I always say, you young people today are really spoiled by your special effects, I mean, this is the Godzilla kids are growing up with today. I mean, it's CGI. It looks real. And uh, here's the one I grew up with, all right? <laughs> I mean, we were happy when you didn't see the strings in the zipper anymore. But, uh, yeah, spoiled, spoiled. I mean, we thought this was cool, you know, back then. But there was also a television show that caught my interest when I was real young called The Addams Family, all right? And uh, there was a plant on that show. That was featured. And anybody remember the name of the plant? Cleopatra. Okay. She was an African strangler plant. And it was clips like this that really got my imagination going. Open up, sweetheart. I wanted to do that in the worst way. And it was when I was in the sixth grade, I had to do a science project for school. Now, I had been trying to grow Venus flytraps from the time I was five. And back then, they didn't sell whole plants like they do today. You can buy them in the stores, fully grown. It was a kit where you would try to grow them just from a, you know, a small bulb-like structure and some soil. Ne never, ever got the things to grow. My parents were so generous. So from the time I was five to ten, I must have tried growing 50 of those things. Never got the plant that was on the cover of the box. But in the sixth grade, I, I had to do a science project for school, and I was looking for my topic, and I was in the library at school, and I found the uh, May 1961 edition of National Geographic had an article titled, Plants That Eat Insects. So as soon as I saw that, oh, I'll, I'll check this out. So I opened it up, and that picture's inside of it. And the, you could have seen my heart coming through my T-shirt at that point. <laughs> And I did, I actually did my science project on these plants. I got an A-plus on the project. I built a Venus flytrap out of cardboard and paper, about four foot tall. You know, I got an A-plus on it. And right about that time, Kmart, you know, a currently extinct store, it's going extinct, began selling full-grown Venus flytraps, potted. And I still remember walking into the one in the Preakness Shopping Center in Wayne, and, and they were on the shelf. It was like Roger Rabbit. My eyes popped out of my head. And I made a dollar, I made a two dollars a week allowance in 19, this is 1970. And I made two dollars a week allowance. And I, they were a dollar 99. I'll never forget this. Every Friday I went there and bought a plant. And, uh, but through that study, I learned how to grow them. And I've been growing them kind of ever since. I got a greenhouse full of them now. That's my, and that's just part of it. I got a lot more than that. That's my granddaughter, Katie. She's my little helper. She just loves going in there and watering the plants. So that's the background of this talk. Now, we're going to start this talk in a kind of place you might not think. And you actually sang this hymn this morning. We're going to start this talk in a hymn. And uh, listen to this. We all just sang this. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise. 
The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. Boy, doesn't that give you the warm and fuzzies, right? <laughs> each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, he made their tiny wings. Boy, that makes me want to grab a mug of hot cocoa and curl up on the couch, right? <laughs> makes me think of something like this. Here's your little bird sitting up there in the flowers. Well, you know what? As I thought of that hymn, Here's a plant that I grow that produces these tiny little flowers. But look what happened to the bird. That's not Photoshop. That's real. This is somebody in the UK, and they put this up on the Internet. That is a plant eating a bird. That's real. And I thought about that, and I said, those hymns are schizophrenic, <laughs> all right? I mean, really. The little, how come there's no hymn about this? I, I want a song. Come on. Let's sing about the plant that ate the bird. And it is kind of interesting that when we sing these hymns, we're singing about a world that ain't real, dude. All right? All right? Because there's a lot of bad things in the world today. There are. And there are plants that actually can eat birds. Some of them eat rats, mice. Oh, yeah. They can eat larger prey. They're not the, they're not the uh, rule. They're the exception, but they do exist. But I did find one children's movie that got the idea right. How many of you have ever seen Madagascar? All right. That's a classic. And if you haven't seen the movie, here's the basics of it. Some animals from a zoo in New York City are on a, uh, being shipped on a boat, and accidentally their, their cargo cases get washed off into the ocean, and they end up on the island of Madagascar. And they land on the beach, and these animals are walking through this jungle, and a song by Louis Armstrong is playing as the background music, What a Wonderful World. And they got this right. Watch this. Here comes our little bird, and here's our plant. The colors of the rainbow so pretty. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful world, but the plants are eating the birds. They got it right. So we're going to examine this topic scientifically and biblically. So one of the questions I often get asked in my seminars is, why do these plants even do this? Why do plants have to eat insects and animals? Primarily, they're insect eaters, but they do eat animals, as I've showed you. And a lot of it has to do with their habitat where they grow. By the way, you've got carnivorous plants right up here. There's a few species. I see some smiles. Yeah, you're sick just like me. I like that, right? They're in this area. I, go on, I actually go on bog treks looking for them, but this is a bog in southwest Michigan, and you'll have a bogs up in this particular area. And one of the things that's unique about bogs, and this goes back to some of our Ice Age talks, is at the end of the Ice Age, during Noah's flood, it actually caused an Ice Age. This area was glaciated, and the glaciers went halfway down through Indiana and Ohio, and that lasted about 700 years, I think. And as those glaciers moved back northward, they carved out grooves in the land. And in some places, gigantic blocks of glacier broke off and made impressions in the ground and formed these gigantic glacial ponds. So we believe this was probably a little glacial pond. And uh, when that melted, this area was once underwater, probably just a few hundred years ago. And an interesting moss called sphagnum moss got into that water. And one of the cool things about sphagnum moss is what it does is it can cover a body of water like a carpet. So when you see that area there, there's water under that. That's literally a layer of floating moss. And plants like leather leaf and some shrubs have got in there. And I was standing on a wooden boardwalk here, but if you step off the boardwalk, which is highly inadvised, and you jump up and down, the whole thing shakes like you're on a waterbed because you're literally on a floating layer of moss. Now, if you accidentally break through that and fall through it, you can disappear forever and become a bog mummy. They find these, these mummies over in Europe and in Ireland, England, people that are in bogs. Some were thrown in and others fell in. And it's, that's a whole other talk with these bog mummies. But uh, it's a very interesting place. And uh, because of the fact you're on a layer of moss on water, there's no trees there. So lots of sun hits this area, and you're going to find out these plants require lots of sunlight. So this blocks the sunlight. They like wet soil. Well, there's a lake or a pond underneath that, which they like. And here's the other thing. That sphagnum moss drinks up all the nutrients in the surrounding area, nutrients like nitrogen and magnesium and calcium and phosphorus. 
I mean, these are nutrients that plants like potatoes, tomato, roses, and corn, they have to have that in the soil to grow. In this area, there's nothing in that, in the, in the water. It's all been draw, drawn up inside the moss and held there. So those plants couldn't grow there. Well, it turns out there is nitrogen in that bog. It just happens to be inside the bodies of the insects and animals that live there. And the carnivorous plants are able to obtain the nutrients absent in the soil by extracting it from the bodies of the insects and the animals they capture. So that has a lot to do with why they do what they do. They need to do that to survive in those locations. And the other thing that sphagnum moss does, while it drinks up nutrients, it gifts off hydrogen or acid. So it becomes a very acidic soil. And the peat moss that you see in the garden centers in the spring, that comes from bogs. And uh, it's the only soil that most carnivorous plants can grow in. So you, put, you try to put a Venus flytrap in like regular miracle Grow potting soil, it'll be dead in a few months. They're actually designed to live in this low-nutrient, highly acidic soil. So that's why they do what they do. So real quick, what is a carnivorous plant? These are some of the characteristics we're looking for. It's a plant that can attract prey. Now, typically, when I say prey, you ain't thinking of a carrot, are you? All right? You're thinking of this. But these are plants that can actually attract prey, and they have the ability to capture the prey they've attracted. And you're going to see today, and we're just going to skim the surface, three ways that a plant, which is a stationary object, can attract and bring prey to itself. And then they're going to have the unique ability to digest or break down the prey they have attracted and captured for the purpose of receiving nutrition from them to make up for what's missing in the soil. Now, Hollywood tends to sensationalize their abilities just a little bit. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I'd grow it if it lived, all right? But I'll be honest with you, that, that, that's not real. They do not get that big, and they cannot chase after you. Plants are stationary, rooted objects, and they got to bring their food to them. So we're going to examine three ways today that a plant, which is a stationary object, can attract, capture, and then kill and digest insects and animals to obtain nutrients. And the first one we're going to look at kind of operates like this. You remember the old shell no pest strip, right? <laughs> It's just a big sticky thing that would hang down from the ceiling and the flies bump into that and they get stuck there and they can't break free. So we're going to classify this type of a plant as a sticky flypaper plant. And here's the first one we're going to talk about. They're called sundews. And sundews grow just about the world over. You won't find them on some islands and in the Antarctic because they can't eat frozen things. You've got sundews right here in this area. There's several species of sundew in this particular area. Here's the basic idea, though. There's the green leafy part, and you'll see that it's covered with these little hair-like structures. And at the tip of each of those hairs is a little gland that produces a droplet of a sugar secretion. That's the bait. And that sugar secretion not only acts as a bait, but it acts as a flypaper. So little insects that land on this, if they can't break free, and you'll see this acting like a taffy, they get glued in place, and then those droplets release a digestive enzyme on the insect immediately. And the insects don't have a skeleton like ours on the inside. They have an exoskeleton, like a knight's suit of armor. Those enzymes penetrate at the joints. Get inside the insect's body, turn it into a liquid, and then the plant draws the nutrients out of it. So just to give you an idea of some of the different shapes and sizes, there's over 200 species of sundew worldwide. And some of them, like this little one from Australia, that's the whole plant right there. You fit a couple of them on a nickel. This one from South Africa has leaves that are long, like two feet long almost, and this plant can almost spread out three, four foot when it's fully open. Other ones have leaves that kind of look like a spider web. Other ones are kind of like round or paddle-shaped. Other ones would be a little more oblong, but, uh, and some are like um, pipe cleaners sticking out of the ground. This one happens to grow in this area right here. You'll find this one right in this area. It's a dew thread. And you'll notice all those black specks you see on those leaves, those are small insects that saw the glistening sundew 
because they do glisten in the sunlight, came to that plant thinking they were going to get a meal. They landed there. They couldn't break free. And then the droplets start releasing those digestive enzymes immediately to extract the nutrients out of that insect. Now, this one doesn't move. Like I said, it looks like pipe cleaners, about, the, about a, maybe seven, eight inches tall. I've got a friend that's nicknamed this grass with an attitude. I've been into an area of the New Jersey Pine Barrens, probably about twice the size of this room, that was carpeted with these plants. And you think on, on a given day how many tens of thousands of tiny insects are being consumed to meet this plant's nutritional needs. Now, there are other ones that move, and these are the ones that are really fascinating. And I'll show you a couple shots of how that works. Here's a box elder bug that Somehow it got on the end of that leaf, and I don't know how it got there. But anyway, here's the box elder. And as the box elder struggles to get free, the leaf reacts. And it, very slowly over the course of a couple hours, the leaf curls up and completely engulfs the insect. All right? Let me show you how that works with a video here. Here's a fly stuck on one of these plants. Now, the worst thing that fly can be doing is moving the more that insect struggles to break free, he's moving those tentacles, and that sends an electrical message into the leaf that tells all the nearby tentacles to fold inward toward the insect. So the harder it struggles, the, the more the plant reacts to it. Now, insects don't breathe through a nose like you and I. They have holes in the side of their thorax and abdomen called spiracles. As those droplets make contact, they deposit the droplet on the insect's body, which suffocates them. And then those digestive enzymes start working. But this isn't the whole story. Here's a mosquito on one of these plants. Now watch. The worst thing this mosquito could be doing is move. So it starts struggling to break free. This is sped up about eight times. You like, it's like those pumpkin rolls. Right here you got a mosquito roll right here. And what's happening is the plant is using hydraulics to squeeze that insect as tight as it can. And the digestive enzymes are working on the insect's body to break down the inside of it. And then the leaf squeezes it like trying to squeeze juice out of it. You know, you got an orange and you're squeezing it just to get those nutrients out of the insect. And then what happens, they get absorbed into the leaf and on this particular insect, when it's done, it will unroll again. It can do this about three or four times. You remember that box elder bug? Here he is here. There he was. There it went. That's what he looked like when it was over, when it opened again. All that's left are the legs and the crushed exoskeleton. And the plant will do that a few times uh, before act, those leaves will wear out and grow new leaves to replace it. And this is happening out there tens of thousands of a day, times a day around the world in different environments. And you know what happens sometimes is spiders come along. And a spider doesn't know the difference between a dead box elder bug or a dead fly and a live one. The spider may jump on that leaf thinking it's going to eat that insect. And their eight legs will stick to that leaf just as good as its six legs of an insect. But those are the sticky fly papers, over 200 species of that plant. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of something here now that's going to make you the hit of your next creation party, all right? I call this part coffee table chatter. Now, some of you were here yesterday, and I assume if you came yesterday and today, you must really like creation subjects. So this is going to really make you the hit of, of the next time you have the folks over for a creation discussion. Uh, see how everybody's watching this guy? Look, she's thinking, man, he's so smart. How does he do this? Oh, he's so interesting. I should have gone with him to church yesterday, all right? So I'm about to give you some information you can take home with you. And the next time you have the friends over for a creation discussion, all right, ask this question, what was Charles Darwin's favorite subject? And it's amazing how many people don't know the answer to this question. Some people might give the answer, well, it was finches. Because he, he wrote a book and he had pictures of finches in it. He loved talking about these finches. Now the beak size has changed. And he thought how that proved his theory. Maybe it was beetles. Did you know Darwin was an avid beetle collector? This drawing is based in a story. He, he was collecting beetles and he had two handfuls of them. And a specimen running by that he just had to have. So he shoved the handful in his mouth to get it. So maybe it was the beetles. 
Did you know he wrote about barnacles? And there's this look the beautiful drawings. He wrote quite a bit about barnacles. How about but maybe it's the Galapagos Islands? Remember, he spent time there, and that helped fuel his ideas for the books he wrote. So maybe it was the Galapagos Islands. Or could the answer be none of the above? All right? It's none of the above. I am amazed how many people don't know this. At the Creation Museum, Tommy Mitchell did a series, a three-part DVD series in the life of Darwin, never mentioned this. Oh, I razz him mercilessly when I say, how could you have missed this? He told us in a letter to one of his botanist friends what his favorite subject was. And here's what he wrote. He said, I care more about Drosera than I do the origin of all the species in the world. Well, what on earth is Drosera? That's the geeky scientific name for sundews. Yeah. And specifically, it was this little round leaf variety was his pet one. He really loved this one. By the way, you have this one growing up here in Niagara. You can find these. And it's a very small plant. Whole plant fit on about maybe a 50-cent piece to, a, to maybe a silver dollar. It's not a huge plant. And here's what he wrote to another botanist as he studied the dry. He said, by Jove, I sometimes think Drosera is a disguised animal. And this is what caught his attention. Here's how the, dr- the round leaf sundew consumes a mosquito. That absolutely blew the minds of the Victorian era scientists. I mean, they just could, they couldn't fathom this. This plant is acting like an animal. And remember, in their day, the Christian worldview was still the dominant worldview, right? And the Christian worldview is God created plants to be food, not to be eating things as for their food. Well, most of us are familiar with this book that came out in 1859, right? The Origin of Species. Here's a, and this one here uh, is the one that made him famous. Most folks don't know about the other books that he wrote. He came out with a two-part, uh, two-volume set in 1871 called The Descent of Man, right? Most people don't know about these two books because the contents are so racist, that it's politically incorrect to talk about what's in these two books. Most people have no clue about them. He wrote another book that came out in 1875 called The Insectivorous Plants, which I give a big thumbs up. It's actually a very good book. It's difficult to read because it's written in that old English style, but it's actually a very good book. Now, why do I say this is a good book? He was not out trying to figure out where these plants really came from. This was not so much about the evolution of these plants. He was out to prove and document that these plants were truly carnivorous. Because in his day, well, in his day, the Christian worldview was the dominant worldview. And you know what the Christians were saying? This was Carolus Linnaeus. He's the fellow that framed the modern classification system that we use with the two, with the two names. You ever watch the Roadrunner where, where you see the uh, coyote run off the cliff and it says Moronicus Idiacus? All right. But he's the one that framed that two system with the genus and species was Linnaeus and he was a Christian. And Linnaeus thought it would go against the order of nature as willed by God if these plants were truly eating the insects. So he, he kind of thought that the plants were just grabbing them and letting them go. Darwin went out to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that these plants were truly carnivores. And most people aren't aware of this. It may be this book right here what gave evolution its biggest jump start in the minds of people because he proved the Christians were dead wrong. This was one area where the Christians were saying no way, and scientifically he proved yes. He did things like put pieces of cheese on the sundew. If it had nitrogen in it, it would close. He put milk on the sundew. He put urine on the sundew. Urine has nitrogen in it. And he, he documented. It's full. This book is full of good, what we call observational science. Testable, repeatable science in the present. It wasn't about really where these plants came from. So in that sense, get it, this, Dar- Charles Darwin is the scientist who is credited with proving these were carnivorous plants. Most folks aren't aware of that. And that was his absolute favorite subject. So ask the, when they all give back, here's your possible correct answers. Are you ready? Time to impress your friends. They're going to give you all the wrong ones. You could say carnivorous plants was his favorite. Out of the carnivorous plants, the sundews were the favorite one. 
If you want to be a tiny bit of a geek, all right, the Drosera, remember that, is the one that was his absolute favorite. And if you want to be a total nerd, that round leaf species called Drosera rotundifolia. But all of the above, he was a carnivorous plant enthusiast. Now, I got to be careful because I'm giving a lot of credit to Darwin here. Tom's getting, he's like, you should see Tom now. He's like biting his lip, right? I'm just saying he was an excellent observational scientist. Don't, let, don't get that wrong. He was good at observation in the present. Problem was, he was horrible at historical science. He had already rejected the Bible as an authority. So any conclusion he had on where these plants came from would be dead wrong. But he actually was right on being on the observation of what they were doing. Now that's the sticky fly papers or the sundews. He also wrote about this plant in the book. Who knows what that is? Right, the Venus flytrap. Tom, I got to give Darwin credit one more time, okay? All right, I, I agree with what he says here. You ready? Let me see if you agree. He wrote this. This plant, commonly called Venus flytrap, from the rapidity and force of its movements, is one of the most wonderful in the world. You know what I can say? All right, Charles, I agree with you there, too. All right? Now, get this. The Venus flytrap, unlike our sundews, which you'll find in a wide area around the world, the Venus flytrap only grows natively one place on the entire planet, and that's right between North and South Carolina, by the entrance of the Cape Fear River mouth, the only place you'll find them growing natively in the entire world or naturally. And that area has been shrinking more and more every year due to human encroachment. Now get this, because of poaching, people stealing them from that area, just a couple of years ago, they made it a felony, punishable by jail time if you get caught taking a Venus flytrap from that spot. Look at this. A North Carolina man will spend at least six months in prison after he removed nearly 1,000 Venus flytrap plants from public game lands. Now, put yourself into a prison yard. You think there's all these big, buff, nasty guys, right? What did you do? Well, I knocked off a bank. And what did you do? Well, I stole a car. What are you doing in here? I rode Venus flytraps. I mean, come on. And so if you want to avoid prison and you like these plants, they sell them in stores now. In fact, uh, when I was at the Creation Museum, we went down to the Kroger down the road, and look, they were $3.99 to avoid jail time. <laughs> so let's examine this plant. Now, this is really fascinating. If you look at the trap on a Venus fly trap, it has an uncanny resemblance to a bear trap. So we're going to classify this, unlike a sticky fly paper, as a snap trap. But how it works has a little bit more in common with a mouse trap than it does a bear trap, and here's why. When you think of a mouse trap in the set position, you have cocked this thing called the hammer back from here, and you lock it in place, and that stores energy in the spring. And it's when that energy is released, whap, it closes very quickly. Then there's also bait strategically located to get that animal up onto that platform. And what are the baits we typically use with mouse traps? Peanut butter and what else? Cheese, all right? Yeah, you guys are right there. Snickers. <laughs> Which of those two would, would you think is more effective? The peanut butter. Pe now, what? peanut butter, right? Because it's sticky. I've seen mice do this. They can run across, grab the cheese, and keep going. But if you slather a gob of peanut butter on there, the mouse has got to lick it off. And the longer he stays there, the better the chances are he's going to touch that trigger mechanism. And that's where the energy is released, and whap! He gets caught in a split second. Now let's compare that to the Venus flytrap. This is a Venus flytrap in the set position right here, ready to catch an insect. You see this little guy here in the front row? What's his name right here? Hey, Camden, take a look up on the screen. If you were a bug, you see how big you are? That's about how big a Venus flytrap would look to you. It'd be about that big. And when you look through the flytrap, you're going to notice the leaf has a slight outward arc to it. Now, there's a reason for that. It looks like it closes on a hinge in the middle, but it does not close on that hinge. The stored energy for the rapid closure of the flytrap is in the outer third of the leaf. So what basically happens, it doesn't close on a hinge. The outer section folds over. And I'll show you how that works here in just a minute. Now, just like the Venus, uh, the mousetrap has a sticky bait, the flytrap does too. There's nectar glands along this inside edge right here. And the idea is it wants the insect to come inside and then start slurping up this delicious nectar all the way up. And eventually, it's going to run into these trigger hairs 
On each side of the leaf, you'll see three or four of these trigger hairs, and that's what snaps it shut. So let's take a look at how that works. Venus flytrap closure 101. So we cue the bug. Lands inside the trap, starts feeding on that nectar, and as it works its way up, if it touches one of those trigger hairs, it bends the trigger hair, and that trigger hair shoots an electrical message out through the leaf, kind of like flipping a light switch. But the trap doesn't close. When the first trigger hair is touched, it's kind of like a 20-second alarm goes off in the plant. And the plant goes on red alert for 20 seconds. Now, if the insect flies off and doesn't eat anything else, nothing happens. But if in that 20-second time period, that insect touches the same trigger hair or another one, second electrical message goes out and the leaf snaps shut in half a second. Now, think about that. Why is it better for the fly trap to acquire two touches, unlike a mouse trap, which takes one? Think of this. You put a mouse trap in your garage and one day you're sweeping out some debris and a pebble hits your mouse trap. Closes on the first touch, bing, right? Who has to use energy to reset it? You do. If the fly trap closed on one quick touch, a blade of grass or a leaf or a twig could hit that on a, on a windy day, and the plant would shut and then have to use its own energy to reopen. But by requiring two touches in a 20-second time window, that raises the stakes. There's something crawling inside of it. So it's not going to close on something that it can't consume. So I'm going to show you a quick clip here of what that looks like, actual time. So here we go. Oh, by the way, I want you to think of this. You can keep the light down. The plant just did something quite amazing. First of all, it can keep time, and it counts to two. I know some people can't do this, all right? But this is a plant that has a timer in it, and it requires those two touches. So here's how that works. Actual speed. You guys want to see it again? Yeah. All right. I always turn the sound off on this clip because it can be a little alarming. You want to hear it with, with the sound on? Yeah. You guys are sick. All right. You ready? Listen. All right. Now, cover your ears if you're faint hearted. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to do that so you guys knew what it was. It's not pleasant for the insect. Now, how many trigger hairs had to be touched? Two. Now, watch this. Not everything that goes in stays in. So here's an ant that volunteered for one of my talks one day. Didn't realize what he was getting into. He's hanging. Oh, no. What, what, what am I doing here? I hit two trigger hairs and wah, bam. It, now, this one bit over here on its neighbor, so I had to pull it off. Now, typically, when these bristles interlock, they act like prison bars. But before the plant can close any further, I've got a very fast, thin ant. And out he goes to tell a whale of a tale back at the anthill. <laughs> now, the plant has to make a decision here. And uh, think of this. When was the last time you had a piece of broccoli and wondered whether it was thinking? All right? Now, the, the Venus flytrap can't think, but it, it's sure going to act like it can. Because in a situation like this, when there's nothing in there that it can eat, the plant doesn't close any further. Almost immediately, it starts to reopen again, and it'll reset itself. It takes about 24 hours to reset itself for the next try. So how does it know whether there's something in there? Well, recent research finally confirmed this. We kind of suspected this, but now they know for sure. Those trigger hairs, it takes five touches for the plant to continue closing. So it takes two to get it to close, and then if the insect is in there running around, then there are three more touches. After the fifth touch, the plant knows, aha, I got something in here I can eat, and it'll continue closing. There's another way the plant knows that there's something in here, and this one's a little bit embarrassing. Hey, Cam, you, are you a brave little guy here? Oh, you did? Hey. I got to show you something that's a little funny. You know how the plant knows there's something else in there? You know what the bug does when he gets scared? Because he goes in the plant and the plant snaps shut on him. The bug goes potty right, right there. And, and the plant, get this, has cells inside of it that can taste that. So it's called urea. 
And get this, by five touches and the presence of urea, the plant knows there's a living organism in there, and it will continue closing. You may have seen advertisements, will eat meat. 99 out of 100 times, if you put meat in a Venus flytrap, hit two trigger hairs, it shuts. The next day, it's sitting there open with the meat sitting there. You know why? The meat didn't move, and it didn't do what? Didn't take a dump, all right? Just to put it blunt. So it's, the, it's interesting. It requires the movement and the biological uh, excretions there. So if you're from Kentucky, you can say it poops and pees. If you want to be scientific, the insect excretes. But that's what it takes. Once it knows it has prey via the movement and the excretion, over the next 20 minutes or so, the plant will snap shut and the sides begin to close in, crushing the insect. And about an hour later, you'll see the bristles are straight up and down, and the edge, get this, it secretes a gasketing material so it doesn't leak anything. So along this edge, a gasketing material is secreted, and you can kind of think of it like this. It was initially like that. It folded over, and then it did this. And then in the end phase, it's like having your two palms pushed together like this, as tight as you can do it. The insect would be in a little pocket in your palm. The pressure on the inside of your knuckles there would seal it with a gasket. The bristles are st straight up and down, and it'll stay like that for about seven to ten days squeezing and pouring digestive juices onto that insect. Same thing with the, uh, the, the sundew. The exoskeleton doesn't digest. The inside of the insect becomes liquefied, and the plant squeezes it out to fertilize itself. And miracle of miracles, we've gone from a plant that was a trap. It now converts itself to a plant stomach. Quite literally, that is a sealed system. Digestion is taking place and the nutrients are being sent down into the root system where they're stored so the plant can make little plants and metabolize and make up for what's missing in the soil. About 10 days later, it's going to open up, and here's what this looks like uh, slowed down quite a bit. It's a very slow process. The leaf sides peel apart. There's your fly. Now, if we take a real close look on an insect that's gone through this process, you see how the eye looks like a kind of like a crushed sandwich bag? Because the inside of the insect is totally hollow. So if you pull the fly out, you can snap it open, and all it's just a hollow shell of an exoskeleton. There's nothing inside of it. And an individual trap on a Venus fly trap can do that three times. Three times. After that, uh, here's one. It has had its, by the way, that was probably meal number one. That was meal number two. And then a week or so later, it opened again. This guy landed on top of it was meal number three. Three insects. Tops can't eat any more insects. That trap will then turn black and die. And other ones replace it throughout the growing season. How many of you ever owned one of these plants? You ever keep sticking your finger in them? Yeah. Hey. Now, it won't kill your plant, but... The reason why you got to be careful, even the closing mechanism only works about 10 times. So if you're one of those giddy types, you keep poking your fly trap shut. After about two weeks, they won't close anymore. It won't kill the plant, but it won't be able to eat insects. How big do they get is a question I'm asked quite often. That's about the largest you'll see a trap on a Venus fly trap. There's a quarter right there. And if any of you are scientifically minded and can crack the genetic code, I am not kidding you. A plant with traps on it that big, I can sell one little four-inch plant for about $100 with traps that big. So if one of you little scientists here can crack the code, and if you could make a fly trap with a trap the size of your hand, you're a multimillionaire. And I kid you not. There have been laboratories, scientists, growers trying for the last 50 years to make large Venus fly traps, and nobody's been able to do it. But if you could, you'd be a millionaire. And it's a good thing we can't because some joker would do this, and that would be me. <laughs> so now you have seen sticky fly papers. We've seen a snap trap. Now we're going to talk about what I call are the gluttons of the carnivorous plant world. These are plants that can consume lots of insects. And the idea is very simple. It's like digging a hole in the ground and letting things fall in, and we would classify this as a pitfall trap. And specifically, they're called pitcher plants. And these grow, uh, you actually have one of their cousins up here. It's a little different than, the, than these. But uh, the ones I'm going to talk about are the trumpets. And you'll find them from about Virginia down through Florida and over through uh, eastern Texas. And there are six basic types. 
and you'll see some color variations, but they're called trumpets because they're kind of like a Roman trumpet, narrow at the bottom and they're wider at the top. Some of these can be anywhere from a few inches tall to up to four feet tall. And uh, so here's the basic idea on a trumpet pitcher plant. Here's the opening on the pitcher plant right here. Long, hollow tube. And then there's this lid over the top. And here's a fly up there. And what it does, it uses nectar glands up here on the lid to attract flying insects to come along to take a meal. Also, if you look at the front of the tube, there's nectar glands that start at the base and work their way up to the opening, and there's more nectar glands under the lid, but where do you see the most shining nectar there? Right over the opening. So whether you fly in or crawl in, this plant is inviting you to the all-you-can-eat nectar buffet over the opening, which is the danger zone. And to make matters worse, on some of these plants, that nectar has a narcotic in it. Insects feed on it, and they get drugged in a matter of seconds. And then further stacking the deck in the favor of this plant, if you look at that area under a microscope, the cells are overlapped like roof shingles, and they're shaped like little tiny shark's teeth. And insects have a grasping foot pad, and they grab onto that. They can't get a grip. It's like grabbing onto lots of little icicles, and they slip. And then to make matters worse, one more trick. If we look real close, there's these little spiky things aiming down. So think about that. The insect is getting drugged on a slippery surface with spikes pointing at its heels. Which way do you think the plant wants the insect to go? Down. Now, this next short clip I'm going to show you is, is one of these plants. It's named Alata. Very pretty name. You'll find it in eastern Texas. The nectar on this plant is really powerful from about August to this time of year. So I'm going to take a fly that I've caught in my greenhouse, and I'm going to put it next to the pitcher and give it a three-second whiff of the, of the net, and watch what the fly does. Now, typically, if you grab a fly with your fingers, I don't care what you put it next to. You can put it next to mama's apple pie, right, or even a pile of dog poop. What's that fly going to do when you let go? Watch this. One, two, three. Now the feet are slipping right away. You see them? He's feeding on that narcotic lace nectar. And down he goes. Leave it down. I got another clip here then, too. He's stuck. He can't get out. Now watch this. He's using every bit of energy he's got to try to get up. Now, he can't crawl up that wall because it's got those overlapping roof shingle-like cells, but here he is flying with every bit of energy he's got. He's almost to the top. But down he goes again. And that'll go on and on and on. Well, as the day goes on on a hot summer's day into the fall, these pitchers can fill up with insects. And you'll hear them buzzing like this. And you can see they're quite agitated. They want out of In fact, if we could translate, you know, hornet into English, you probably wouldn't be hearing very nice words right here. <laughs> look at this. Come back at the end of the day. Look, the pitchers almost feel. Look how slow they're moving. They're using up all their energy. By the end of the day, they run out of energy, and they die, and the plant produces digestive enzymes to break down their tissues. Anybody feeling sorry for these guys? I'll let, them over. I'll let them loose at your house. One of these tubes, no joke, you get three, can hold a couple hundred insects like this. You put a plant like this near a hornet's nest, and you can decimate it in about three days. We've done that before. It's kind of fun. Go get a Coke and a pretzel and put it by the pitcher plant. You know, put the pitcher plant, watch what happens. Now, why couldn't it fly out? Why did it come up and go down so quick? Well, think of this. In order for that insect to go up, he's got to beat his wings to create lift. Well, when that happens, he automatically sucks air in from the top. So what he did is that as he was trying to go up, he was pulling air in from the top, and then it makes a cyclonic type effect. So the harder he tried to fly out, the more of his own energy he was using against himself. He just kept pulling himself back down. What a horrible way to die, right? Think about that. And then it makes matters worse. Some joker will come along and do this to him. You know, I did that for science. You people are twisted. <laughs> All right. You come back at the end of the summer into the fall. You cut one of these, like do an autopsy. Here's what you find inside of it. 
I mean, literally can be filled to the top with insect exoskeletons. Digestive enzymes have just filled the tube, broke down their tissues, absorbed the nutrients, and uh, by wintertime, they just turn brown and die. Next year, all those nutrients are stored down in the root system, and you get more pitcher plants the following year. Now, I want to talk about the type of plant that ate that bird. These were, that, this is an American plant. The pitcher plant we saw eating that bird is called a Nepenthes. And you find these most in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Borneo, in that particular area. And uh, these plants don't grow out of the ground like a pitcher tube. They hang on vines. So I took this picture right here at the Botanical Gardens in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, Myers Botanical Garden. And they had a hanging basket. And this will give you the idea. Here's this tendril. And then the pitcher grows on it, on the end of it, like a big, kind of like a mug with a little lid on it. Some of these, the pitchers can be about that big. And on other ones, this one right here, Raja, they could be the size of a basketball. These are the largest. They can actually hold a two liter. And uh, the, this tendril will pump a liquid inside, and you see the liquid right there. The rim is very slippery, and the inside of that rim has little spikes on it, like a steak knife. So if an insect falls into that liquid, the wall is very slippery, and then it has to get out past these little spikes. And they primarily consume ants. I mean, they can consume thousands and thousands of ants. But uh, if a bird, like what probably happened with that bird, it was landing on the rim of that plant and reaching in with its beak to pull insects out, and it slipped and fell in head first. Well, its feathers were caught on those little spiky things, and it couldn't go backwards. And you and a bird, either one of us, if you're stuck with your head underwater, guess what happens? And the digestive enzymes will break a bird down in about a month. Probably not a very, uh, very good-smelling prospect there. But get this. There are recently discovered these different symbiotic relationships between these type of plants and certain insects and animals. Get this. They've recently discovered a species of bats that roosts inside these pitcher plants. And here is the bat flying back to the plant. And what he does, he's above the, the digestive enzymes. He roosts right up in there, so he sleeps there. Yeah, it's amazing. And they both benefit. The bat gets a nice place to sleep away from predators. What do you think the plant gets? Do they make outhouses in the wild? All right. The bat poops in there. And that's a fertilizer for the plant. That's just, there's many of these we could talk about. Here's one that's really fascinating. They discovered a species of tree shrew that goes to these plants. And the tree shrew will sit his little, rec little you know, uh, hiney over the end of that, and the underside of that lid is just coated with nectar. And he licks the nectar off. And they notice something. Virtually every time they came and licked off the nectar, before they left, they pooped into the pitcher plant. And it was becoming too obvious. So the scientists scraped off some of that nectar, and they did a, a, an analysis of it. And guess what? It's a laxative. So the plant is literally luring the insect there to have a meal so it takes a dump. And they both benefit. The shrew gets a meal and the plant gets some fertilizer. But <clears throat> smaller shrews weren't so lucky. They were finding some small... This is a digested shrew. They're finding inside some of these pitcher plants. Sometimes they find rats and what have you. So we say, this is your father's world. They, the plants are eating the birds, right? So we want to take a look at this through biblical glasses. Because just like in Darwin's day, they didn't have an adequate answer for this. So we want to have an adequate answer. Well, first thing I want to talk about, Venus flytrap. Think about what we just saw, okay? It has a 20-second self-resetting timer on it, right? It counts to two and it counts to five. Right? It has chemical sensors inside of it that sense the presence of urea. And here's another thing. It reproduces itself. I like to see an engineer build a mousetrap that when it wears out, spits out new mousetraps. You never have to go to the store again. All right? This plant is self-reproducing. It makes little fly traps. Everything about this plant screams it is the product of intelligent design, not some evolutionary process of chance over chance and mutations. Biblically speaking, when were the plants created? Day three. Here's where it starts getting a little crazy, though. We're told that the plants were to be food for everything, right? Plants don't die like animals and humans do. This, 
We, we hear sometimes, well, don't plants die? They're not biologically alive. Let's say like a raccoon or a human being. They don't have a, they don't have a, a life spirit. Uh, the Hebrew word is nefesh. They do not have that. In fact, plants are designed by God to be eaten. That's how they reproduce. Because what goes in the horse's mouth here when he has apples, guess where that comes out full of seeds? At the opposite end. They're a renewable resource. Not only that, they help clear the atmosphere. But they don't die like, let's say, we do or, you know, a higher organism. So they were designed to be food. God looked at the creation on the sixth day, and he calls it very good. It's miov and tov, two words put together. Literally means good to the utmost. You can almost call this um, perfect. Cue the light one more time. We're going to take a quick trip back to day six, and you might have seen a scene that looks something like this. potential dangers, the world can be a far less threatening place. Take the scary out of life with Traveler's Insurance and see the world in a different light. I don't know this company from Adam, gave the lights back, but you know what? They got it right. Now, that's kind of fascinating when you think about that. If the Bible paints a picture kind of like that, then what went wrong? Well, one of the things they didn't do in Darwin's day, at least the Christians, were not looking into the Bible to see what went wrong. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve broke God's command and sin entered the world and cursed was the ground for what they did. And watch this. Plants are specifically mentioned. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to thee. There was a change to the plant life as well as the fact Adam and Eve's body would now begin to age and decay along with all the animals. When I see a plant like this, that's one of those Nepenthes. Look at the hooks on that. Very sharp. There's the nectar. You put a mouse, sticks his head in there. He ain't pulling it back out. He's going down. That's like a thorn. So we would surmise structures like this did not exist prior to this point. They are a result of the curse. Exactly how God did that, we can't say for sure. Whether he coded it into the genetics so that he could bring it out because he knew that they would fall, or whether he just added it later, we're not sure. But structures like that would not have existed. How about this plant? Who knows what that is? Poison ivy. Q, Adam and Eve walked through the garden buck naked prior to sin. Okay? They didn't have to worry about sitting on a plant like that and having a reaction like this. You have to take into consideration that there is a curse on the creation. And if you doubt that, just put the 6 o'clock news on, right? 6.03, you'll see all the evidence that we're living under a curse. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And if you're looking at me through glasses today, guess what? Goes back to that event. If you've ever had braces, goes back to that event. Little sick babies, goes back to that event. Everything is a result of the curse. It's the reason why we all die, goes back to the curse. We're in a cursed world. Now, we could just say, amen, goodbye, have a good day at this point, but there's some good news, all right? There's some good news. The very creator who created everything and put the curse on the creation because of our rebellion and sin did this for us. God demonstrated his own love toward us. The creator did this. And that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ, the very creator, stepped into creation and died a substitutionary death on the cross to take the sins of Adam and Eve and all their descendants and anyone that would put their faith in them have those sins forgiven and have eternal life. That's the message of the gospel. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament, it's very easy to read this and not think through it. This is uh, the Pentecost time. Peter is preaching and he's speaking about Jesus and Luke records this for us. And about P uh, Jesus, Peter says, heaven must receive Jesus until the time of restoration of all things. Think about that. Jesus went back to heaven until a time of restoration of all things. When you think of something in a restoration, it looked good once. It's a mess. And that's the create. And someday it's going to be put right again. 
And that's talking about the creation. Someday when the Lord comes back, it's going to be restored. And uh, we'll close on these verses. Some of my favorite verses. If you're an animal lover, you like animals? Right, I'm an animal lover. I love these passages. Book of Isaiah, talking about a future time. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. All right, we put a wolf and a lamb together today. What do you get? Lamb chops, okay? The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatling together. You take a lion and put them together with a calf. What do you get today? Steak, Steak right? Look at that. Goes on to say, the and a little child shall lead them. That's my granddaughter. Hey, Mom, can I keep them? You think about that. Goes on to say, The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Hey, wait a minute. That sounds like Genesis chapter 1, when everything was created initially to eat plants. So the, one of the great news of the gospel, not only do we get to have eternal life, but here's one of the things Jesus is going to do. Last book of the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 3, and there shall be what? No more curse. Churches like this, we want, to, we want to proclaim the message. Someday that curse is going to be removed. Right now we're in a curse. But you know what? You can have your sins forgiven and have eternal life in that time period. And that's what we look forward to. And telling that message to everybody, come to Christ. There's going to be a restoration. You need to have Christ. You need to be saved. It's an amazing message. And here's the one I want. If the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb, is the fly going to lie down with the fly trap? I don't know. So if you think these plants are cool, grow them now, because I don't know what they're going to be like then. It doesn't talk about them. So, Tom, you want to close in a word of prayer? And Thank you, Ron. That was awesome. Father, thank you so much for this amazing demonstration. But it was very important for us to see that, yes, this is part of the curse. Many of the species of animals and things we see today were not meant. You created a good, a very good creation. Death and bloodshed came because of one man's sin that entered the world. And that rebellion began and, and instituted and initiated the death process, which goes from Venus flytraps and on, wolves and lions and all that. Father, thank you that you have a day, we have a day coming that you will restore all things. We're thankful. But Lord, we are so grateful that in your mercy and your grace, as we just said, you demonstrated your love. You didn't want us to see this world continue to suffer. You've provided the way of escape. You've given us an answer, and that is Jesus Christ stepped into time and space, who was called the second Adam, to undo what the first Adam couldn't do, and that is to be, live a perfect, sinless life to be the one qualified, to be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, to die for each of us when we deserve to die. And Lord, if we put our faith and trust and realize it's your grace, it's not anything we can earn, you promise us eternal life. And I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know that grace, doesn't know, hasn't received that gift, that in the quietness of their heart right now, they say, Lord, save me. I receive Jesus as my Savior, Lord, and ask you to forgive and wipe away all my sins. And that's as simple as that. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Just dismiss us with a rich blessing. And we, we thank you, and we just thank you for Ron, your servant, and also for Terry, ministering to our children today that you brought them our way this weekend. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. If you'd like to learn more about the, the issue of salvation, I have a little booklet here called 31 Days to Living a New Life as a New Believer.